Hi, I'm Caroline. And I'm Adrian. And this is Scandal Sheets. Welcome to Scandal Sheets, the podcast that explores the scandals of history along with the people and places associated with it. I am your host, Caroline, and I am joined by... I am your co-host, Adrian. We've already had this discussion about how you're not, you're not co-host anymore. Oh. You're a host. But there's two of us. We did have this discussion because yes. I was like, we're both co-hosts. I, no, I, we're both hosts. Okay. It's fine. I feel like we should be both hosts. I'm just going to rewrite the rules and say we're both hosts. Okay, that's fine. And also your host, Adrian. Sure. (laughs) So the architecture host and you're the scandal host. Can I be the captain of scandal? Yes. I like that. I like scandal winch. Scandal winch? (laughs) Well, I do have the coffee cup with the winch on it. So (laughs) that would be very apropos. So if I'm going to be the captain of scandal. Captain scandal. What are you going to be? I don't know. <laughs> Captain, <laughs> Captain Style. Captain Art. Because it's... I don't know. We'll have to come up with good terms. Right. Yes. So, yeah, you weren't expecting Some me to go down that time. I wasn't because I would have had something ready. I didn't either. I just sort of, you know, hmm. went down that. Cause no, I like I'm that. I'm unpredictable. So, okay. Yeah. No, we'll think about that. Yeah. So, I am Caroline, your Captain of Scandal, and Adrian is to be determined (laughs) yeah Hmm. okay so uh we are going to finish up our second episode on william randolph hearst and Mm. his fabulous hearst Hearst castle Castle. Mm -hmm. Uh, last week we discussed william randolph hearst and oh before i forget you are entirely correct he did go by wr no way. I totally made that up. You did? Okay. I did. I so, did. Because when I was writing my notes, I'm like, I'm not going to write out William Randolph every single time. And I didn't want to say Hearst for whatever reason. Yeah. Oh, because I'm saying Julia. So right. I figured WR. Yeah. And Julia. So that was his nickname. That's funny. Yeah. So we talked about WR's early life. He was the son of a millionaire miner. Prospector. uh, Prospector. Thank you. And uh, he was uh, expelled from Harvard. Mm -hmm. For For the beer party. Beer party. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's awesome. And then uh, he later uh, bought a New York newspaper. And that was sort of how he began his media empire. And he hired some really great journalists. Right. Who he let have bylines where bylines did not exist before him. That's correct. Correct. And then uh, he was basically the reason why we decided to do him beyond the fact that he has an awesome house is because he was one of the originators of yellow journalism, which was just this real sensationalized form of journalism. I thought it was really interesting. I later read about him that if he wanted something to happen, he would report on it and it would happen. Really? Yeah. So very, very interesting that that's kind of how he did things. But uh, he would marry kind of later in life to a chorus girl, back to the chorus girls, and they would have five sons together. Mm-hmm. W.R. never really gave up his fascination for the co- the chorus girls. So he ended up he got getting a new one. Right. He got a new one. And uh, he ended up getting into an affair with Marion Davies, who would eventually become a well-known early actress and the movies so and they were together for a long time for yeah for over 30 years so very very long time oh because he died in 51 were, were they together yeah they, they got death? together like 1918 okay so a little over 30 years that's before the house was built right so yeah leading up to that when did he start with the 20 1922 22 I think so, yeah. Okay, so yeah, and starting... Actually, they, as a couple, moved to California in 1921, and so in 1922 was when the construction of Hearst Castle began. So, right, he asked Julia Morgan to build his estate in 1919, but it did not break ground until... 1922. I think. Maybe. Maybe the 
it broke ground oh they had those other cottages so yeah. the main house was last and that's what didn't start until 22 but the other houses were being constructed prior to the main the, the big, big one, house the okay yeah. well that actually makes sense that he and mary he stayed moved, th- right yeah, he out moved there to the site 21 mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. so and a lot of people just say oh they moved to hearst castle and without knowing that sure there's several pieces to that puzzle yep so, Adrian, how about you go ahead and just tell us a little bit about the the building. Hearst Castle is considered Mediterranean style or Spanish colonial revival. And Julia had originally thought of it as a sort of medieval facade with a single tower. But the plan was reworked so that there are two towers. And the whole estate is the main house and three guest cottages that have that similar Mediterranean style. And around the entire hilltop site, there are terraces and a pool, an outdoor pool that's giant. The cottages were built first. So that gave W.R., his wife and children, a place to stay as the main building and all the other site features were under construction. The site was nearly impossible to navigate to. And if Julia had not been trained in engineering, there's no way that construction would have gone as well as it did. She also designed an enlarged pier at the village of San Simeon, which was just this tiny whaling town, well, village, not town, on the coast. And they had never seen ships like the ones carrying all of her stuff from New York. All the antiquities and architectural elements that he had purchased all had to be shipped to San Simeon. And that's why they had to enlarge the pier because these existing pier was just not constructed to handle the the size and type of ship that was coming in with all of these antiques. So over the course of the project, Julia had four warehouses built to house all this stuff, the architectural details, furnishings, and various antiques that were to be incorporated in the what was known as the Enchanted Hill House. It was such an undertaking that Julia Morgan actually designed five really beautiful Mediterranean style houses for the most important workers and their families. The house was reinforced concrete faced with limestone, I believe. It was really light colored stone veneer. Did it come from Indiana? What was Indiana limestone? Was that Greystone Mansion? Uh, yeah, and that's also Biltmore is facing Indiana right, limestone. Right, right. Yeah, so. it's funny. So architecturally speaking, the main facade of the main house is symmetrical and it's divided both horizontally and vertically into three sections. So it has a really nice rhythm to it. Horizontally, it has a strong, tall base, a narrower midsection or shaft with a continuous balcony, an even smaller top section. And that's where those um, the two towers are featured with um, kind of a low pediment in the middle with a really decorative tile work mosaic on it. It seems like in those towers, that, that's where the like the main staircases were. Correct. Correct. So there's four towers, two have staircases and two have elevators because this is the 20s and it's, you know, late enough for an elevator. Right. And because everybody needs an elevator in their house. Well, right. It's 322 steps in the, sp- the spiral stairs in one of the towers. And just one. Yeah, Hmm. and... The tile work is really amazing. Sorry, I'm looking at the book cover, the Julia Morgan (laughs) architect, and it's... Wow. I I wish they would do... And maybe they do, like, a rooftop tour, because that would be awesome. They have these lions holding shields. Some of them may be cast. I don't know. I don't know if this is... These are old or new. And behind each of the lions, on top of this frieze... So behind each line, there's a lamp, or a... It's like a column. It's a twisted column, kind of semi-Corinthian with just this giant globe above it. Right. So horizontal, you have sort of base shaft capital. And vertically, there's the two flanking sections, what I would call, ha- are the ones with the towers on them. And they have less detail. They have, it's just blank at the first level. And then at the second level, there are two sets of doors, one over the other. And then sort of a dental cornice. And then the level where the towers are the projecting middle section is the one that has the most detail and it has 
beautifully carved friezes, a balcony balustrade, um, engaged pilaster, cast iron gates, and then there's like secondary balconies under a, a wide, a really low slope pediment. And it has some more of those, this sort of shield looking. So it's very, it's kind of Baroque, I guess. Uh, well, it's that Spanish Baroque influence, but also, you know, with all the tile and the towers and this decoration, it's Mediterranean. So it picks up on both of those stylistically. Material wise, the bright white facade was cast concrete with a stone veneer with ornamentation made made of cast stone by a contemporary craftsman, supplemented by late Gothic Spanish limestone figures. The unornamented part of the facade perfectly balances the elements containing the most detail. So it could easily have gotten too much too fast, but it's really well composed so that the detail, like it brings your eye to all the places with detail without being overwhelmed. I think between the guest houses and the main building, there were 127 rooms to fill including 58 bedrooms, 49 bathrooms, 18 sitting rooms, two libraries and other spaces like the theater and billiard room. Yeah, I'm just I'm checking out the website right now. Right. They have a they have a great website and there's lots of different tour options. Yeah, that's, um, so I'm looking at like the Grand Rooms tour, which is just the first floor uh-huh. of Casa Grand or the Channel. So like Deal. assembly room, right, and there's refractory morning billiard, room, billiard yeah. room and yep. theater. Yeah. They say it's approximately 159 steps while touring this, <laughs> both up and down, and two thirds of a mile walk. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it takes a while. So, to but that's the, the most—that's the least strenuous of the <laughs> tours. <laughs> so, as work progressed, there were more antiques coming and they were all purchased to be installed in the various rooms of the mansion so there would be things with more gothic flair spanish flair italian flair because they had kind of different themes depending on what room you were in and some of these artifacts were requested by julia specifically to there's a couple that were that specialized in Spanish artifacts, and she wrote directly to them for these items. And there were brackets and arches, whole ceilings, millwork, and these were all purchased and stored in the warehouses that she designed. The items were a combination of antiques, like I mentioned, and there were also new creations made by extremely talented craftsmen on site. Decorative ceilings installed throughout the house were actually suspended from the concrete structure and bared no weight. So the elements, you know, brackets and these ceilings and such were were put, were installed so that they look structural, but they're not. They're just hanging from the structure. And where a salvaged European stone or wood ceiling did not fit exactly, Julia made it work by supplementing what was there with site created elements done so expertly as to defy detection and when you look at pictures of the interior there's seriously there would be no way to tell what would be a salvaged antique and what she had the craftsman make in the 20s it's it's just that well done the floor plan is organized in a large y shape where the arms of the y if you will, are are L's rather than angled arms. So it's essentially a square U with a shaft and base. And uh, if that doesn't make sense, the the plans are online and you can Google them to see how it's laid out. The procession goes like this. When you enter through the grand front doors, you walk through an alcove before entering a two-story assembly room oriented left and right, but the entire width of the house. You proceed through a refractory situated perpendicular to the space, and then the plan intersects a cross axis. Four earthquake-proof 24-foot diameter stair towers contain the circulation with two outfitted with modern elevators, like I mentioned. The assembly room has a dark carved coffered ceiling, high intricately carved bracketed and paneled wainscot, an enormous stone mantle with two carved male busts flanking the fireplace opening, over which a frieze containing details of armor divides the mantle into an elaborate top section with additional busts on either side of a coat of arms and more figures in relief. And again, it's just the scale of all these things and the, the mantle is just so... It's just such a sculptural element. Like, there's just a lot going on. But it's really quite a piece of art. With I've never seen one with all these figures and, and busts like it has. The next room, the refectory, is entirely gothic in nature. This room has an even grander mantle that measures 28 feet tall with another wood coffered ceiling. This one with life-size saints gracing each section. 
Julia Morgan intended there be to be a significant shift in scale between the assembly and refectory. So the mantles were brought up to emphasize the high ceiling rather than bring the ceiling down. Much care was put into the design of the theater, which occupies the entire north wing of the first floor. There are velvet seats for 50 viewers, fabric panels on the walls, exposed wood 